Hello all you risk takers and truth seekers to podcast live the Butterfield. Today I want to talk to you about big big bomb. That bomb is called Tsar bomb. Of course, it's a Russian. And why I want to talk about this one? Because it's a final act. For those who don't know me, my name is Mario Beckes. I'm the Guinness World Record holder. I spent 1800 consecutive combat days in a war and as well I work in military and diplomatic intelligence sector. Now, let's go talk about uh, Tsar Bomba. That's what they call them, Tsar Bomba or Tsar Bomb. This is the final act. And I want to ask you a question. Do you see that world is dividing again into two antagonistic blocks as it did during the Cold War? Let's go step back a little bit. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, declared that the world was witnessing a conflict between the Moscow and Western civilization. The split of Russia into two distinct entities brought back memories of the Cold War, when Russian authorities openly discussed the use of nuclear weapons. And as you remember, everybody was an expert last year and this year, when we spoke about Russia, about weapons and how war is going to be won by Ukraine or Russia, will Russia use the nuclear weapon? Is uh, Putin dead? Ah, is uh, Belarus going to have the tactical nuclear weapons? Guys, you, me, nobody doesn't know what's happening in the heads of those in charge of those weapons. You and I don't know what a military strategy is doing. Now, military strategists and the generals, they're playing the war, they're executing war. But the outcome of the war is not decided on a battlefield, but in the hands and heads of those who started. Politicians. And don't be naive. Don't speculate. Russians have this, Americans have this, we have this one. That's not the idea. Don't make a sensation of something you don't know. Same goes, will Russia use nuclear weapons in Ukraine? No, they will not, because it's very simple. I'll give you a quick story. When the Chernobyl happened in 1986, I remember, you know, we were on the street as a kid, you know, I was finishing my primary school and going that same year, I need to go into military school for my high school. And uh, I remember we heard all these sirens, you know, wow, this is like a sound, like what's happening, you know what I mean? And they told us that something exploded in, in Ukraine, some nuclear plant, and it's going to be you know, nuclear holocaust. It wasn't. It started sort of snowing a few days later, but I don't remember military was in charge of everything. They were bringing the food, everybody look after us, you know, the doctors and everything else. But we've been in sort of like type of lockdown a few days. And um, I know that people were afraid. People were afraid of radiation. That was it. And then there was no internet, there was no uh, social media platforms, nothing. We just saw something that a Russian bravely flying with the choppers over the Chernobyl and uh, pouring the concrete and water, whatever they did. And the brave soldiers of the Red Army, they are shoveling all the debris. And, you know, it's, it was just, nobody told us these people going to die after a few hours, a few days. Now, let's go look back 60 years. On a cold October day in 1961, a remote island in the Arctic Ocean hosted an event that would shake the world to its core. You don't know which one it is? The Soviet Union, which was engaged in a furious arm race with the United States, had just tested the Tsar Bomba, the largest nuclear weapon yet built. With a yield of 50 megatons of TNT, the detonation was a more than three times more powerful than the bomb that demolished Hiroshima. 16 years before. 3,000 times more. Can you imagine? 3,000 3, times more than Hiroshima. If you think Hiroshima was not bad, can you imagine? 3 times more. Well, Russians, they done kaboom. The testing of the Tsar Bomba, which remains the most powerful nuclear bomb ever detonated, marked a turning point in the development of nuclear weapons. Now, you ask yourself, what is Mari talking about this one? What is the Tsar Bomba? Well, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union developed the Tsar Bomba nuclear weapon. Of course, a nuclear weapon device. 
It was the largest and most powerful nuclear bomb ever exploded. Oh, if you don't believe me, ask Dr. Google, producing 50 megatons of TNT. The bomb was developed by a group of Soviet scientists led by a guy called Andrei Sakharov and tested on October 30th, 1961. The United States and the Soviet Union were engaged in that arm race that culminated, of course, with the Tsar Bomba test, which brought disarmament and nuclear non-proliferation treaties back into prominence. Why is that? We well, see, when you drop the bomb like this, we can talk about all these wars, local wars and, you know, a little bit, little bit regional wars, maybe. But when you drop the bomb, which is a three time, 3,000 times more stronger than Hiroshima one, yeah, even you think yourself, what if this is dropped on me first? There is no time to do, respond. Now, that type of weapon puts everybody back to the negotiation table. That's why. The current context of the nuclear weapons race is as follows. We still have the Russia on one side and the United States. We have a China, India, North Korea. However, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States both produced and tested more powerful nuclear weapons at a rapid rate, which was known as the nuclear arms race. Of course, race began in late 1940s after the United States successfully detonated the first one atomic weapon in 1945. Seizing the opportunity to compete with the US nuclear weapons, Russians, yeah, well, they quickly began work on its own nuclear program. Why? Because they have somebody close to Oppenheimer, or maybe Oppenheimer itself. The two superpowers were engaged in dangerous game of supremacy in which they were always creating more powerful and sophisticated nuclear weapons. United States detonated the first hydrogen bomb in 1952, which was a 10 times more powerful than atomic bombs used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II. I'll repeat this one more time. United States developed hydrogen bomb 52, which was only 10 times more powerful than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Russians nine years later developed 3,000 times more powerful than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, in retali retaliation, the Soviet Union tested its own hydrogen bomb a year later. Through the 1950s and 60s, both sides continued to develop it and test nuclear weapons in an attempt to create weaponry that was more lethal, effective, and capable of eliminating, eliminating their fall. And now you ask yourself, maybe that's the problem we have with uh, global climate change. Yeah, who will say that one? You know, Australia has the hole, ozone hole above. Australia was one of the testing sites for the British as well. Many bombs exploded. However, when we talk about global climate change, if you believe that all these testings caused global climate change, let me know in the comment section below. The arms race was fueled by both a desire for strategic advantage and mutual fear of each other nuclear capacity. Each side was dedicated to maintain the balance of power so that other could not gain advantage. And both were convinced that having more nuclear weapons would make them more secure. As a result, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union remained so high, raising the prospect of nuclear war and making the world more dangerous and unstable. But how this Tsar Bomba was created, or who created this one? In the late 1950s, a group led by physicist Andrei Sakharov, who had previously been key in the development of Soviet Union's hydrogen bomb, he started working on a Tsar bomb. You know, the Tsar, it's a Tsar, it's a, like an emperor, it's a, it's, a, it's a pharaoh above the pharaohs, that's in Russia. Sakharov group, for those who didn't know what the Tsar is a meaning, Sakharov group design would use a complex fusion process to achieve an explosive yield of up to 100 megatons. 
However, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev ordered the design be cut back to 50 megatons due to concerns about the weapon's potential political ramification. The Tsar Bomba was finally developed as a three-stage thermonuclear device with a length of more than 26 feet, 26 feet and weight of almost 60,000 pounds. The weapon was developed in secret and not even the Soviet military was aware of its own existence until just before the test. That's how secret this test and development that bomb was. But bomb like this can only create explosive situation amongst the people. Because of size and weight, the bomb had been dropped from the height of 10,500 meters, but specifically modified Tu-95 bomber, which Russians still have that type of bomber. And I know many, uh, many uh, weapon enthusiasts and uh, those who love the war talk about war, but they don't go in the war, they don't go in the army, but they know everything. To Polyam 95, Tu-95 bomber, Russians have that for the reason, because they still have the, those bombs. And only that type of bomber can carry. A parachute was fitted to the bomb to delay its descent in order to give the crew ample of time to fly the bomber outside of the detonation radius. The bomb exploded 4,000 meters over the remote North Island in the Arctic Ocean. And uh, that's how it was tested in Arctic Ocean. The explosion created a fireball with a diameter of more than eight kilometers and the mushroom cloud 64 kilometers tall. Now guys, it's like a chessboard, eight by eight, 64. Diameter of eight kilometers. This is like modern Western type of city with the millions of people. But what we're forgetting, it's not just a radius of explosion, which is covered the ground, but have a 64 kilometer tall mushroom cloud, which needs to fall down with the winds and everything else. Windows were shattered up to 900 kilometers from the epicenter, and the shock wave was felt as far as Norway and Finland. That's how far away it is. The explosion created a seismic shock equivalent to a magnitude of 5.0 earthquake. Ask yourself, could you imagine such an explosion? If that imperial bomb had exploded over, let's just say, densely populated area, the potential devastation would have been enormous. Nothing will stay alive. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, had no intention of using the bomb as a weapon. Allegedly, again, the purpose of the test was to demonstrate to the United States that the Soviet Union was substantial nuclear power and to demonstrate to the rest of the world that the scope of its nuclear capabilities. That's a big BS. The new bomb terrifying realism is that nuclear weapons raised between the United States and Soviet Union reached a climax with that Tsar bomb test, or called the Imperial Bomb. That's what you can call. Both nations built increasingly powerful nuclear weapons in the 50s and 60s, but the Tsar bomb test convinced both sides that the development of such weapons should be limited. Why is that? Because it's not the Russians just build that weapon. That means that Americans can build even bigger, and maybe two or three of those bombs. Hasta la vista, baby, there's no more Earth. Everybody talks about nuclear weapons, everybody talks about war, but nobody doesn't know that these things, when they explode, no more kumbaya, no more happy days, no positive thinking, but a nuclear holocaust. In 1963, the United States and Soviet Union signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty which prohibited nuclear testing in atmosphere, ocean, and space. The consequences of the Emperor Bomb, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever detonated, can still be felt today. And I'm asking you, feel free to leave in the comment section below if you believe that all this nuclear testing caused some type of climate change. When I say the consequences of Emperor Bomb can be felt today, what I mean about that? Developing of this weapons, reintroducing the summer measures and the importance of nuclear non-proliferation treaties into the public consciousness. The Tsar bomb test served as a somber warning to future generations to avoid utilizing 
nuclear weapons at all costs, as well as a stark reminder of their lethal potential. 60 years after the first test of this lethal nuclear weapon, we are on the edge of nuclear war with multiple nations armed with significantly more powerful and lethal weapons. That's we can feel today. More nations have their weapons, nuclear weapons, than ever before. And everybody in secrecy, most probably developing, who has a more powerful, stronger, and more destructive weapon. Let me know in the comment section below, do you know something about the bomb or the Imperial nuclear missile, they call them? If not, let me know in the comment section below. Let's all learn from each other much more. Better by leaving comments in comment section below. Feel free to subscribe, share, like, and comment. Thank you.